Hello everybody and welcome to the Carl Am Cymru Revision Session. The session this evening will focus on ecosystems as part of the GCSE and will be presented by Mr Cobb from Iskol Abertafi. The session will last around 45 minutes where Mr Cobb will run through the relevant content. If you have any questions during the session, please use the Q&A question and answer section and we'll do our best to answer you. You will see that there's a hyperlink in the Q&A section. If you're happy to leave your name and address, we would love to keep in touch with you so we can send you information about future events. You can click on the link at any time during the session. Today's session will be recorded and the recording and any relevant resources will be uploaded to the ESCOL website under the Carl M. Cymru tab. Thank you, Mr. Cobb. Over to you. Hello, everybody. Uh, right, OK, this is Ecosystems. It's the second part of the Ecosystems um, a lesson if you like so the first one i did a couple of weeks ago and i covered you see what i've ticked on there is we did food chains and food webs pyramids of number of biomass and we did decay and the idea would be to do decay in the carbon cycle but we just did decay so we're going to start from the carbon cycle today which means we've got quite a lot to get through um to try and cover everything um but i'm sure we'll manage it so we'll see how we get on okay so let's um then move over to move on to the carbon cycle so Apologies, everyone. Something seems to have happened here. Just bear with us a minute. Apologies, Mr. Cobb, I don't think we can hear you. Don't know if there's a problem there, whether we rejoin and start again. Is that better now? Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Right. Thank OK, you. so nothing has been heard since I started my uh, bit on the carbon cycle. Am I right? Yes. Yes. OK, let's go back to that. then. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so with the carbon cycle, um, it's all about um, well, we begin with that carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere and it's about maintaining all that balance that's kept with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So really the idea is that the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere should be constant. Now, most of the things we're going to refer to here are about returning carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, but the uh, only one which actually takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere is photosynthesis. So the equation for photosynthesis you're probably aware of, uh, you should be now that it's carbon dioxide plus water gives glucose or produces glucose and oxygen and that glucose contains the carbon in which we uh, which plants then sort of store that uh, or take that carbon out of the atmosphere and they incorporate it into glucose within the plants. Um, now plants also respire okay which means they are, are going to think of the equation for respiration looks like the opposite of photosynthesis the key feature now is that carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere. Now there's <clears throat> that um, 
that doesn't balance out. There's more carbon dioxide taken up by plants that that is released in respiration. And because that's because a lot of that carbon in the carbon dioxide is incorporated into the body of the plants, um, to the tissues of the plants, or the biomass of the plants. The carbon in those plants can be passed on into consumers when those consumers feed on those plants. So if those when they do that, the carbon that's in the food that they have just consumed, the plant material that they've just consumed, some of that will indeed be incorporated into the, uh, the animal tissues or the consumer tissues in carbon compounds. Again, storage molecules, it can be anything from um, more carbohydrates, fats, proteins, uh, is it going to be carbon? Those are carbon based. But animals, as we know, also respire. So we see respiration again is retaining carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Now, both carbon, both um, animals and plants, all the consumers uh, and plants die. And as a result of that, those dead organisms still contain carbon. Um, when they're just lying there, if you like, and, and, and dead, there's still carbon within them and that carbon needs to be um, re released. And um, we just talked about the previous end of the previous lesson. We talked about decay. Decay carried out by microorganisms and what those uh, microorganisms are doing, they are feeding on those dead organisms and they are using the dead organisms as a source of nutrition. And they do just like all other organisms do, they respire. Um, using that dead material as the starting point, as the fuel, they respire and release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So that is very nice. That works out. For, that, that's pretty much balanced um, what you're seeing on there. But there is another source of carbon dioxide, and that comes from um, fossil fuels. So fossil fuels like coal and oil and natural gas, when they get burnt, um, they release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Now, those fossil fuels have been formed as a result of many years of um, uh, those those dead organisms not undergoing the normal decay process. So when decay is prevented, and that usually means where there's a, a lack of oxygen um, reaching those uh, that the, the dead organisms, meaning decay can't take place by microorganisms. If you then fast forward um, a few million years uh, with increased pressure or heat, that, that, that could result means that you end up with uh, fossil fuels and now we're burning those fossil fuels and that's what's causing uh, an increased level of carbon dioxide that's why at the moment we don't have a balance um, with our carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere carbon dioxide levels are increasing uh, and that's largely a result of burning fossil fuels i'm sure you're all aware of it okay now as always we look we, we know we've got to remember this so i'll give you a little activity to try and help us do that so I wonder how many of those you can actually identify. As always, you can pause, and then when you're um, uh, uh, when you're ready and you've had a go, you can start the video again. We'll do this a number of times today, and then you can check as if you're right. So the numbers I've got in here are uh, not in any particular order. Um, your job is to be able to identify all of these. Uh, so I've got respiration was number one. Number two was feeding passing on carbon from plants to animals. Number three is the carbon in the animals. Uh, number four, down here is, is death. Uh, number five uh, is respiration. Number six is carbon in dead organisms. Number seven is combustion. Number eight is decay. Number nine is death. Uh, number 10 is fossil fuels or coal and oil. 11 photosynthesis and 12 carbon in plants. Now, um, what I think is always important to do, you may not get this in a question, but I always think it's important that every, um, at the end or start of every arrow, whatever that picture is in this case, it's written as carbon in plants. Rather than just plants, we're emphasizing it's the carbon cycle. So carbon in animals, carbon in dead organisms, and you could even have said carbon in fossil fuels, because then this is how the carbon is moving. This is where we're finding the carbon, and the arrows are the processes by which that carbon is passed on. Uh, right, let's have a look at uh, a little question on this. So it says the diagram shows some features of the carbon cycle. The features are labeled A to D. So this is a great example of what you can expect really, uh, in that you may know the carbon cycle and think you've learned that version uh, or, or your own version, but actually 
you need to be able to identify that does not look that picture does not look like um, the carbon cycle on the previous uh, slide. So um, you've got to be able to identify what the the issue is uh, there or what what corresponds to what. The key thing here is we have a plant and you have a process there taking it out and a process taking it into the plant. You've also got fire suggesting some combustion there and you look about coal deposits there. So OK, so let's see what we should have again. You can always pause this and have a go yourselves. But this is what we should have. So which one is combustion? Uh, well, straightforward at C on there. Uh, respiration. So that's going to be the release of carbon dioxide from the plant and a store of carbon those coal deposits, those fossil fuels. The name of the gas at X, well, that has to be carbon dioxide. And the name of the process B, photosynthesis. It's a very basic question, but it's useful just to get uh, familiar with um, the transition from your version of the carbon cycle to the type of thing you're going to see in a question. Right, OK, let's move on then to the nitrogen cycle. So the carbon cycle is, I think, probably the easier version the easier one. Let's look at the nitrogen cycle, how nitrogen cycle is um, is cycled. So there's a little bit more going on here that probably needs a bit of ex explanation. But again, we start with just nitrogen in the atmosphere. We had carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now we're talking about nitrogen gas in the atmosphere. Now there are bacteria in the soil uh, which are able to fix nitrogen. And what we mean by fix or fixation of nitrogen is convert um, nitrogen gas into um, well into nitrates. Now nitrates, what's the significance of nitrates? Well actually as humans we're really interested in nitrates. More than anything else it's nitrates that we're concerned with and the reason for that is because nitrates are absorbed by plants and they are used by plants for growth. So it's those nitrates that really are going to encourage better growth in a plant. So we as humans as we try and grow plants we want uh, as many nitrates in the soil as possible. And that means that if we've got um, nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil, uh, that's fantastic for us uh, as humans. We want more of those, uh, as, as many of those as possible. However, those actually are not very common. Bacteria which are able to fix nitrogen into nitrates actually are not very common. Um, uh, however, there are, some that exist in the soil and there are also some that exist um, within the root nodules of legumous plants. So legumous plants, things like sweet peas, uh, things in the, the pea family actually is a good example, clover. They're, they're quite specialists. There are not many of these, but there are there are certain plants which have nitrogen fixing bacteria in little what look like lumps on their roots. Um, and they've got this what we call a symbiotic relationship. They live alongside one another. Uh, and they they benefit from that relationship. So it means that those those plants are able to get nitrogen without absorbing nitrates from the soil. They can actually get nit or nitrates really directly from nitrogen gas in the air. So there's two possible ways in which nitrates can get into a plant. For most plants, they have to absorb nitrates from the soil. For some plants, uh, they are a, they um, are able to fix nitrogen directly because they have these specialist bacteria within their root nodules, within their roots. So then what happens to that nitrogen in the plant protein? Well, just like it did with the carbon cycle, it's passed on to animals. So when animals eat plants, they are consuming protein within them. Uh, they, they are consuming protein within the plants and they will use that those proteins to form new um, proteins within their own body. So we've got nitrogen in animals. Now, just like you had with the carbon cycle, there are some similarities here, so it does help plants and animals die. And we end up then with nitrogen in dead organisms. So just imagine, you know, if you've got a dead animal, the, the, the point at which it is dead, there is still lots of nitrogen within that body. Um, uh, so that needs to be recycled um, and returned to the soil. So how does that happen? Well, decay, um, um, we've talked about decay, uh, previously prior to the carbon cycle and here we are again when those dead organisms undergo decay by microorganisms uh, ammonia is released now what's the significance of ammonia uh, well we'll come back to it in a moment because also uh, there's another source where we're going to get to ammonia when animals excrete they produce um, excretion 
the radiates uh, urination or defecation, they're producing urine and feces. There are other types of excretion, things like sweating is excretion. Anything which leaves the body really is excretion. But most um, pressing now, most um, salient now is the urine and the feces, which are produced uh, as a result of excretion by animals. Now, the urine and the feces also goes decay and also forms ammonia. So ammonia is formed as a result of a de decay of nitrogenous compounds in dead organisms or indeed in urine and feces. Um, so what's the significance of that ammonia? Well, the ammonia is converted into nitrates. Now that's carried out by these bacteria, which we call nitrifying bacteria, but that completes the cycle largely because we have back now forming nitrates, which can be absorbed into plants, which can be absorbed by or consumed by animals, which undergo death and excretion and so on. And we can have this cycle working quite nicely here. That works quite nicely without the involvement of nitrogen in the atmosphere. Um, uh, but um, ultimately, we have to include nitrogen in the atmosphere uh, because it does um, play a significant contribution. And that's not the end of that. In fact, there's one other thing that uh, we need to include, and that's um, the sort of the negative aspect uh, of, of things that we don't want as humans, that uh, we do have other bacteria called denitrifying bacteria, which can convert nitrates um, back into nitrogen in the atmosphere. Now, we don't want this because remember, our major focus is on nitrates. Uh, so this is really um, what we want, what we, what we want more than anything else is, is the nitrates um, as high as possible. So denitrifying bacteria are not a good thing for humans. Happens more in sort of waterlogged soils where there's not much oxygen um, present. So farmers will often do what they can to prevent that. So they'll plow the soil, they'll improve drainage. Um, but the important thing to note is that there's only one arrow which is going the other way back to nitrogen in the atmosphere. And it's one that humans really don't want to happen. Now, there's a lot going on there. The good thing about the nitrogen cycle is it's not too dissimilar to the carbon cycle. There's similar things going on, but there are it has its own you know, specialties, if you like. Um, but we're going to have to know this. OK, you're going to have to know that in the same way we did the carbon cycle. So let's have a look. Could you recall all the things that are on there? Again, you can pause the video. And then I'll go through them. So. Started at the top there is nitrogen in the atmosphere. Number two is nitrogen in plants. Number three, nitrogen in animals. Number four is the result of death. Well, it's nitrogen in dead organisms. Um, uh, not in particularly uh, good order here, but number five is nitrates. Number six is ammonia there. And number seven is urine and feces. You're going to need to know this very well. Uh, I often um, uh, ask pupils to redraw the carbon cycle, but move things around so that they become used to seeing the nitrogen cycle in more than one way. Otherwise, you always expect a nitrogen in the atmosphere to appear on the top, and that's just unrealistic. Here we go. And there's a is a question now um, that we can have a look at. So it shows some stages in the nitrogen cycle. And look, even there, I can't even see nitrogen on there. OK, we've got nitrates. We've got that ammonia there, protein in plants, protein in animals. Uh, they mentioned urea, so found in, in urine. And then you've got dead plants and animals there and they don't join those up. They've just got them separately and that, all that's fine. But you just have to become familiar with the nitrogen cycle so you can identify um, these different processes. So we got um, a letter here for absorption by plants. So that must be uh, oh, there. It's all of them on there. So that must be A because plants absorb the nitrates and then decay by decomposers. Well, that's got to be D there because it's dead plants and animals. Uh, feeding is passing on from um, protein in plants to protein in animals, so must be B. And then excretion producing urea, found in urine, so that's C. OK, and, and again, it just gives you an idea of how well you need to know the nitrogen cycle. You need to, I always tell my pupils, you need to be able to draw the nitrogen cycle. Not because you'll be asked to draw it. You won't be asked to draw the nitrogen and the carbon cycle. OK, that would that would be too much. But if you can draw it, you know it well enough to be able to identify any stage when uh, a new version of the nitrogen cycle is pre presented to you. Right, OK, so let's move on. I said we'll try and cover as much as we can. And I think we'll be able to get through all these. So we're on to indicator species. So it's worth mentioning at this point that decay, the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle, those are on the biology specification, OK, not at the double science specification. So if you're doing um, double science, um, you need to know about um, 
pillar is the number, pillar is the biomass. Um, and now when you come on to indicate the speech of wealth, the, 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 or everything else which are on these two talks that uh, other than um, carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle and decay. OK, right. So describe how pH and oxygen levels may be used as signs of pollution in a stream. Descri describe how indicated species may be used as signs of pollution in a stream and describe how lichens can be used as indicators of air pollution. So let's have a look how we assess pollution. So. This is the, the bedrock of this, that different animals, different plants, species have different levels of tolerance to pollution. And if we know that, we can utilise those um, animals and plants. So certain species can be used as indicators of the level of pollution, and they are referred to as indicator species. So any species which is sensitive to pollution functions as an indicator species because we are able to, to um, determine the level or give us a guide to the level of pollution by whether those species are present or not, those indicated species. Now, lichens are an excellent example of an indicated species. Uh, lichen lives on, um, you often see it on stones, on trees, uh, and is very sensitive to sulfur uh, dioxide uh, pollution in the air. Some are more, lots of different types of lichens, some are more tolerant than others. So the type of lichen found can be used to assess air pollution. So there's a couple of examples of lichens on there. You can see you'll be familiar to see those pictures. You can see you should I imagine you'd recognize those and say, OK, I now know what lichens are. But you can see certain ones uh, like this one uh, here, the Xanthari, I think it says um, that can tolerate a higher level of um, sulfur dioxide up to 70 uh, micrograms in the, per, per meter cubed, uh, whereas this one um, can only can't, can't tolerate that high. It can only tolerate up to about 35 micrograms per meter cubed. So if you're seeing this one present, uh, the ever the Avernia, it's telling you that um, the air quality must be clean enough to allow it to, to live there. Um, so, um, whereas if you didn't see any of, uh, of Avernia, but you saw lots of the Santharia, it would tell you that, okay, it must be a little bit polluted here because I'm not seeing those ones which can, uh, which can't tolerate high levels. Now, invertebrates can also be used um, uh, and they're used to monitor water pollution because it tells us about the level of oxygen in the water. Certain invertebrates we know can only only present when the oxygen level is high enough uh, and others actually will be present nearly all the time. They don't need a particularly high level of oxygen in the water. Now, we know then that if we count the number of the different indicated species, we can get an idea of how polluted it is. Worth mentioning, though, we can also test the pH of the water and we can monitor the level of oxygen using a probe um, to indicate the level of pollution. Also, the trouble with doing that, the problem, the reason indicated species are so useful is because they are in that environment permanently um, or, or not, as the case may be. Whereas scientists, if they're going to test the pH of the water or the level of oxygen, you're just getting a snapshot of what it's like on that day. And um, that can be affected by a number of things. I, I say that day, even that just that time of day, in fact, a number of things, the temperature might affect it, whether there's been rainfall recently. Rainfall may um, wash chemicals off from fields and into the um, uh, into the water, and that might have an effect on, say, the pH. So that's why indicated species are so useful. So, as I done before, here's some words to fill in. You can pause the video and then check your answers afterwards. Right, so species that are used to measure the level of pollution are called indicated species. Um, lichens, uh, note the spelling is not lichens, it's lichens, um, are an organism which lives on stones and trees, are sensitive to the level of, key now, sulfur dioxide. That's the gas that they are sensitive to. And then number four is invertebrates can be used to monitor the level of water pollution. The presence of different indicated species can tell us about the level of uh, oxygen in the water. And scientists can also test the pH of the water and monitor the levels of oxygen to indicate the level of pollution. Now, I think what's on that, that slide there is all the facts that you need to know. More likely, you're going to have a question where you need to apply that. So I've just taken a, a, a little um, a uh, snapshot of a question here because this really is not just about well it's it's uh, not about 
that you didn't need any knowledge of indicated species here. This is really about taking data and trying to figure out what's going on. Again, you can pause the video, have a go yourselves, and then we'll come back and look at it. So it says, Gareth surveyed the positions of five lichen species, A to E, in woods surrounding a coal burning factory. He plotted the results on the chart below. And then we've got a key down here, so you can see we've got the center here. This is uh, the factory there. Uh, and you can see that immediately around the factory, look at the key down here, there's no lichens. These red, these black dots here, so there's no lichens. You've got the usual direction of the wind. You can run from, from the west. And then the 8E indicates which lichen species are present. So you can see that the wind is blowing the, um, the pollution from the factory um, from the west. So there's going to be more over at the east there. And if you think that sort of makes quite a bit of sense, if you look what's going, there's no lichens immediately around the factory. But if we go out to the next zone, you can see on the easterly side, the east side, there's there's no lichens. But on the west side, there are some lichens present. And if the wind is blowing the pollution from west to east, you can see there's going to be more pollution on the east side, and therefore there's going to be fewer lichen species present. So that's the, the, the essence of what's going on here. So let's complete the following sentence by underlining the correct answer. The usual wind direction is from the west. Well, they told me that there, usual direction. And they're, they're, this, I think, is a foundation question. But they're gearing this up for you. They're sort of teeing this up because they've, they've, they've hinted now what they want. Uh, it says, now it says, give the letter of a like an A to E most sensitive to air pollution. So now your job is to figure out which one could be most sensitive. So you can see here that A is like the first lichen to appear in this polluted area to the east. So A um, isn't going to be very sensitive to air pollution. And then if we go out further where you would assume there's getting less polluted, I've got A, B, C, D, but no E. Now, if I go to the equal distance on the west side, I am seeing A, B, C, D, E. So E, it appears, whilst it appears on the west side, doesn't appear on the east side, and it's the last one to appear. In fact, we haven't even seen it yet. That suggests then that E is the most sensitive to air pollution. And the fact that we see A so early on, um, I mean, it's so close to the factory, suggests that that's the least resistant to air pollution. So it gives you a good idea of the type of question you can expect on lichens. There's less of an emphasis on recording knowledge, like I showed on the previous slide, and more in terms of applying. Right, OK. <clears throat> Penultimate topic here on bioaccumulation. So again, is asked, explain how some heavy metals present in industrial waste and pesticides enter the food chain, accumulate uh, in animal bodies and reach a toxic level. So let's have a little explanation to begin with what we mean by bioaccumulation. So it's defined as the buildup of a toxin as you move up the food chain. To accumulate means to, to pick up um, more and more, I suppose. So bioaccumulation is to, to pick up more um, toxins, in this case, in, um, uh, in the food chain. So let's take a food chain. So you can see I've got a um, largely marine food chain here where I've got algae consumed by shrimp, consumed by Arctic cod, consumed by ringed seal, and consumed by a polar bear. If we turn that into a pyramid of biomass, well, look, pyramids of biomass, remember from the previous um, session on this, are very simple. They always look the same. They always look in a pyramid shape. Uh, all you need to do is count the number of, um, um, of number of levels in the food chain. We see five levels here. So just do five bars um, and make sure they get smaller each time. And that's your pyramid of biomass, nice and easy. Now, let's have a look at the issue here. So what if um, we added some pesticide into the um, or heavy metal particle? The key, the key is this is a toxin which is not broken down by cells if it entered the water. So that toxin would end up on the algae. Uh, and if you count them up there, what have we got? We've got 10 dots to indicate how much um, particles there are. It doesn't really matter about the number, but I'm starting with 10 because it's countable. Now, those algae that are represented by that bar at the bottom, okay, the algae being the producer, are consumed, according to this food chain, by all of these shrimp on the second level, the primary consumer. They are, those primary consumers, the shrimp, consume all of that algae. And if they're consuming all of that algae, they are consuming all of that toxin. So what that means is those 10 um, particles 
are still there. Now, if you remember, pyramids of biomass, they get smaller each time because only a small proportion of the energy consumed is used for growth and goes into the tissues of the shrimp. So an awful lot of the energy is lost. But the tissues is where we're going to find the toxins. So you can see those 10 particles are still present in the in the uh, tissue of the shrimp. Same thing applies with the Arctic cod, which consume all those shrimp. All of those particles are present. But look, the total biomass is reduced. And this is all total biomass. Remember, this is the total biomass of the algae at the bottom. The total biomass, meaning all those shrimp that consume the algae, add all the biomass together. And that is what's represented by the bar. Then we get to this ringed seal, which consumes all these Arctic cod. I might have two or three of those ringed seal. You add up all the toxins in their tissues and we've got those 10 again, and they might be consumed by a single polar bear. And in that single polar bear, it's got relatively little biomass compared to the algae, but those 10 particles are still there. Now, that's, now that's, the problem is that those 10 particles are present at a higher concentration. See, the biomass decreases, but the number of toxin particles stays the same. So at the very top of the food chain, they're at a very high concentration compared to at the bottom of the food chain. And uh, what are the consequences of that? Well, when the toxins get to a particularly high level, it results in reduced fertility and or death. Two key things worth uh, learning there. What are the consequences of bioaccumulation? Reduced fertility or death. So that sums up really the key parts of, um, of bioaccumulation. And as before, um, let's see if you can pause the video and have a go what numbers are missing on here. So bioaccumulation is number one, build up of a toxin as you move up the food chain. Uh, no particular order. Now, number two down there is uh, a pesticide or heavy metal. Uh, number three, the biomass uh, decreases, but the number of uh, toxin particles stays the same as three and four. Number five is the high concentration. Number six is the lower concentration and seven and eight is reduced fertility or death. Now, how does that look in a question? Very common to see questions like this where they give you a food chain and they're talking about a pesticide here and they're telling you here the um, it says the unit kilojoules indicates the energy in organisms at each level of the food chain and represent uh, kilojoules per meter cubed of water per year. The number in brackets shows the pesticide concentration in parts per million. Now, the key thing to note here is look at the pesticide concentration in parts per million. The unit is not important here, but notice this is you know, a very small number, uh, 0 0.00005, and then it goes up to 0 0.04 and then up to 0 0.16 and up to 32.5 in the pike. Pike, at the top of the food chain, remember? And it's at that point the concentration is highest. So we know what's going on there. This is bioaccumulation taking place. If you look at the first question, so percent is a percentage question. Calculate the percentage of energy in the producer that has reached the third stage consumer. This isn't really about bioaccumulation. This this is more about just can you work out percentages? So whenever you're doing a percentage question, you use this opportunity. Look, write on your script, write on your paper. All right, they want me to work out, get the producer and it's energy they want, the energy in the producer. So I've circled that, 88,000. And the third stage consumer, there is the pike, 88 kilojoules. Uh, 88 kilojoules as opposed to 88,000. And they're asking, what is that 88 as a percentage of 88,000? Really common type of percentage question. Take your 88, divide it by your 88,000, and then multiply by 100. OK, and it's a very small number, a yeah, value of 0.1%. Worth practicing percentage questions, they are very common. And then the next question B says over a period of three years, the number of fertilized eggs per fish decreased in the river. Use the data shown in the drawing and your knowledge to explain the reason for this decrease. Now, they talk about fertilized eggs and it's it, it leading you on to that drop in fertility. They haven't mentioned the term bioaccumulation yet, so you're likely to get a mark for that to explain what's going on. So you get Mark seems as if there's an accumulation of pesticides, or you could call it just a bioaccumulation, bio or you can say an increasing concentration of pesticide, which is um, equally good. 
and it can reduce fertility, which is what we just learned. Now, we don't mention death here because that's not the, the question is about. It says the number of fertilized eggs per fish decreased. So this isn't about um, death, this is about fertility. So it makes them infertile, reduce reproductive rate. Any of those things are fine, but that should fit in quite nicely with what we just covered. Right, last one, algal bloom. So it says explain the effects of fertilizers and sewage on animals living in water. So this is an example, there's a picture there of uh, well, algal bloom going on, uh, where you can see just this sheet of well, algae. It can be other plants too, but um, uh, a sheet of algae on the surface of um, this pond or, or canal, whatever it may be. So what are the stages that take place in order to re result in? And this is a problem, so let's just see why. So first of all, we get this fertilizer or manure. It runs off farmland and it goes into the pond. And like we talked about the nitrogen cycle, they love that. Um, the plants will love that. So the photosynthesizers, including algae, grow rapidly. It doesn't have to be algae, um, but um, we're really concerned about any plant species which sit on the surface of the pond. They grow rapidly because they've ha just had this fertilizer come into the pond. So they're really keen to grow um, because you're effectively supplying them with a load of nitrates. Um, and we call that algal bloom because it's often algae that are the issue. And those photosynthesizers, okay, be it algae or whatever, they cover the surface of the water. Now, why is that an issue? Well, it means that the light can't get through that surface and reach those plants at the bottom. So as a consequence, those plants at the bottom of the pond, they die. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, we saw in the nitrogen cycle that when things die, uh, and the carbon cycles as well, sorry, when plants and animals die, key hitting here when plants die the microorganisms break down those dead plants or feed on them um, in order for them to um well to, to uh, feed and and then ultimately then to, to reproduce and so you've got the number of microbes is increasing significantly now when microbes um, are feeding on those plants they are using the the the, the nu nutrients within that plant to release energy and respiration and respiration um, requires oxygen. So when those all those huge number of microbes that are now present respire, they use up the dissolved oxygen in the pond. And that means now there's not enough oxygen in the water, so the fish die. So as a consequence of fertilizer or manure running off into farmland, we ultimately get what's often referred to as dead zones. So actually ponds, lakes um, that have got very little life in them at all. Uh, because of this sequence of events that's taken place. Let's do a little task. OK, you can see all those. So again, the sort of thing you can you can pause, but let's put these in order. OK, so those are the, just the things I just mentioned. You can pause the video, see if you can put those in order. Right, assuming you've now had a go at that. Let's see what you should have had here. The first one, that fertilizer or manure runs off farmland into a pond. What's next? Right, so those photosynthesizers, including the algae, grow rapidly, algal bloom. Let's keep going. Number three there, photosynthesizers cover the surface of the water. Now that now means, number four, that light is unable to reach plants at the bottom of the pond. And that means that um, those uh, lower plants will die because they're not receiving any light. Um, and then we got those microbes that break down or feed on the dead plants and reproduce. Uh, and that means the number of microbes increases significantly. And then we have respiration process in the microbes, uses up dissolved oxygen in the pond. And finally, lack of oxygen in the water means that fish die. OK, those those stages are important. We need to uh, you need to know those ones. It's just a common question and and actually <clears throat> a bit short for time. So I'm going to um, actually jump through to uh, this last question, which is really the essence of um, uh, algal bloom. It says, Scientists think that nitrate pollution could result in dead zones in which marine life could suffocate. Explain how this might happen. Now, the hard thing to gauge there is that this is talking about algal bloom. Ultimately, he's talking about algal bloom and that process we've just talked about. So how could nitrate pollution result in dead zones? This is the sort of thing that would appear on a, a, a biology paper as opposed to a double science paper because they're mentioning nitrates. Um, but the principle's good. 
um, that uh, so we've got to then think why is it we're going to have these dead zones? Well, let's just see. I'm going to move on from these. So look at what's going on. Nitrate causes the excess plant growth or algal bloom. The O W T T E means all words to that effect. I mean, as long as you're indicating that idea, that's fine. That they don't talk then about the cover in the surface and light not being able to get reach the bottom. They just skip to plants then die. Um, so they've skipped a couple of stages there. Um, and then the bacteria, decomposers, the microorganisms, any of those use oxygen for respiration. And that then results in these dead zones because the marine life could suffocate um, because they're not getting that oxygen. So the hard thing to do there was to identify uh, that this question is all about algal bloom and, and the consequences of it. Right, OK, so let's look at what we've covered now through these two sessions uh, on ecosystems. So session one, we looked at food webs and chains and we looked at pyramids of number and biomass. Uh, and we had uh, we started on uh, the decay. But then today, then we've gone on to the carbon cycle, which is an extension of the decay process, the nitrogen cycle again, which is linked into the decay process. And it's those two decay in the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle, which don't appear on double science. They're just on um, biology. Um, so worth keeping that in mind if you're a double science um, student. And then indicated species does appear on double science. Um, we looked at today bioaccumulation and algal bloom and its effects. So it's a bit of a whistle stop tour of the ecosystems unit because there's a lot in the ecosystems unit. But I'm hoping, I mean, if you've um, watching the recording, then you're able to pause and have a go at doing some of those activities to improve your understanding and indeed your recall of those topics. OK, hope you enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carp. Hope you all found today's session useful. This is the end of the biology GCSE sessions for this term. We will be back in 2023-24, so look out for the details on the ESCOL website. Bye for now.